So basically what's going to happen is there'll be um, on Thursday of next week, there'll be, we'll spend uh, doing final exam review, similar to like the midterm review. That will be before this assignment CB is, has disappeared. So um, even that review can help be a refresher if you want to sort of make sure you're scoring well on this assignment that'll be due next week. And then once this uh, disappears, then the Tuesday of the following week will be a second final exam review. So any questions that could have came up on Thursday um, that maybe didn't get answered or after you sort of, you know, thought about stuff that happened on Thursday, new questions came up on Tuesday, then those can kind of come up. So we'll have those two exam or periods to sort of review all the topics because the final exam will be comprehensive. It'll be the same length though as the midterm. And so there'll be a bias toward kind of, um, you know, more questions from after the midterm than for the midterm, but still we'll be asking this from before the midterm. So, so I want to sort of give us enough time to make sure that we have, um, you know, feel comfortable about everything, not just after the midterm, but back to the beginning of the semester as well. Um, only other thing that I posted about is that there is an Ask a Physicist webinar that is run by Paul Davies and uh, Sarah Walker that um, is about, uh, they've got a guest uh, speaker that will be um, answering questions and generally having a conversation about whether plants are intelligent. And so it's talking about information processing in plants. And so if we go back to unit G, we talk about information processing in protists, information processing in animals. Um, and so this is an opportunity to sort of talk about that in plants. And so, um, you know, this is a webinar um, in the evening of Monday, April 24th. Um, you have to register ahead of time, and if you register, it'll give you a Zoom link for that webinar. I think it will be interactive, so you'll be able to pose questions as well, but it's similar to the previous, uh, so this will be more public-facing. The previous bonus assignment I gave was much more sort of uh, aimed at kind of a more technical audience, and this will be aimed at a sort of a broader audience, and so um, it, it might not get as much into the weeds, but I still think it'll be sort of interesting and provocative. So that's an opportunity that will, like the previous one, add uh, five points to the reading exercise category for anybody who wants to go and do that. So basically, you go to the webinar, and then there's a little kind of quiz online uh, that you'll answer those questions, and then each one of those questions will earn you bonus points uh, if you're interested. Question? Yeah, so it's um, it's mostly 
Are they going to have a talk and then you ask questions afterwards? I don't know exactly how it'll be formatted. I've never actually um, you know, logged into one of Paul and Sarah's Ask a Physicist things. Um, I, my guess is that they have sort of some general questions that, um, you know, that they'll probably ask the speaker to share some general ideas about information processing the plants, and then they'll probably have some opportunity to collect questions from webinar participants and then answer those. But I don't know for sure exactly how they're going to run it. It'll be much more informal. It'll be much more of a conversation back and forth, more like a panel than uh, a talk. And then also, is the final exam also two-parted, like the midterm ones? Yes, it'll be a two-part exam. So it'll be um, a state or two-stage exam. So the way the final exam will be set up is in the last week of the semester, Tuesday will be our second review session, and then Thursday will be stage one of the exam. So um, likewise, we're going to try to give you multiple days that you can work on stage one, like Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, similar to the midterm. Um, it'll be a timed exam again, 90 minutes, but it'll be designed to be completed, um, you know, in a class period. So that'll be one of those things where you could come to the class period on that Thursday, but you don't have to because it'll be a Canvas-based exam um, it'll be using lockdown browser, exactly like the midterm. And then uh, during finals week, I think it's on the calendar. I think our day of finals week is like there's a on a Tuesday. So um, similarly to like I did with stage two of the midterm, like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Maybe, in fact, I might even give you all the finals week uh, just because there's it's auto graded. Um, so I'll give you at least three days of finals week that you'll have to do the group portion, the stage two portion. I will be here during the whatever the you know the block that they've given us on Tuesday uh, for a normal final exam. If you want to come here to work together like a lot of you did in stage two midterm, that's fine, uh, but you don't have to. So it'll be set up exactly like the midterm, in fact, the same length. It'll just be a comprehensive exam instead of an exam you know, the midterm material. So in the like ones, you'll be able to bring uh, the same set of formula sheets. So all of the same kind of uh, conditions apply from the midterm to the final. Any other questions? I've been going through and trying to finish up. Uh, so there is, uh, you know, at the beginning of every unit, there's like a study guide at the top. And I think all of them have been finished up through unit G. And I'm working on the learning outcomes, sort of what to know for units uh, H, uh, I, and J. So those will be sort of finished soon. So if you're wondering, like, what should I go back and make sure I know from these units, make sure to take a look at those study guides. And, it lists sort of the specific things that I hope you'll take out of every unit. Okay. All right. So, um, so there's no other questions. That's pretty clear. Um, so today I just wanted to wrap up, um, you know, kind of the, the, uh, emphasize the main points of the iterative prisoner's dilemma, and then introduce to you a couple of other games that are arguably maybe more important in the prisoner's dilemma when thinking about sustainability problems. So if we remember from last time, um, you know, if we just sort of back up and think about these simplistic models, you can say, you know, like, you know, simplistic models, like what are they good for, right? So, um, and so I'm talking about simplistic um, idea or, or computational models. And if we think about the process, the scientific process of sustainability science, um, you know, models, but, you know, um, remember, so what, um, what is our general definition of models? What type of question do models answer? I heard one, so maybe, uh, so what if questions, right? So they, they generally answer what if questions. And they're useful. Um, in both um, the observational phase of science as well as hypothesis testing. So if you think about it, there's, I said the scientific process starts with observing something in the natural world um, and then noticing an odd pattern. And then if that non-trivial pattern then will inspire you to ask, why is that pattern occurring or how is that pattern occurring? And then you can come up with hypotheses. So the why and how, those are causal questions. 
The hypotheses are plausible answers for those questions, and they apply generically. So, and then to test those hypotheses, you then come up with an experiment, and the experiment fits into the if I run the experiment, then I get a prediction. So an if-then statement is a prediction, and the because is the hypothesis. So every hypothesis should hopefully give you a different prediction in the same experiment. So you can run one experiment and then simultaneously test potentially multiple hypotheses, um, maybe excluding some and then finding support for others. So that's kind of the process there. And so when we have these um, idea models or computational models, um, sometimes we have an idea that we're testing, like um, we, you know, we, we have a hypothesis that we're testing that, um, you know, that temperature is what is the primary thing that explains some pattern or, uh, or sex is the primary thing that explains some pattern or uh, moisture level in the environment or something like that. And so we might be able to run a simplistic model that that has you know, just those things different in, you know, in one situation or another. And we'd say, well, if really moisture is a big driver here, then in a simplistic model where we don't have any other confounding factors, then moisture should be able to drive it. If it doesn't, then you know, moisture is really not enough. You know? So that would be an example of, of hypothesis testing. But it might just be that you know, we're interested in what types of patterns can occur. And so we might run, um, a simple simulation of thousands of people in an airport and we might run that simulation over and over again and due to randomness you get different patterns of people moving through that simulated airport and we might notice that huh you know uh, 90 times out of 100 we get this condition that we weren't anticipating and then that would lead to the how or why question so we can use simulations to help us observe new patterns or if we have hypotheses in mind we can use them to uh, to test these hypotheses, and so um, so generally, like the I think that Mitchell uh, basically identified that there's sort of four things that you use these simplistic uh, things for. It's to sort of test plausibility um, or uh, yeah, impossibility. And she said um, it's to explore uh, variations as stepping stones towards complexity. And so um, what we mean by that is, uh, so like the first example I gave, the, the explore plausibility, that's like testing hypotheses like is moisture enough to explain this pattern we see? Well, if I do a simulated forest that varies in humidity levels, uh, then what patterns do I get under this simulated forest? And if I don't get in just this overly simplistic model, um, the patterns that I'm suggesting might occur because of humidity or moisture or whatever, then probably that doesn't speak well for this humidity hypothesis. And maybe I shouldn't go out and do an expensive model in the real world to test this humidity because I can't even get it in a cheap model. Um, but then explore variations. So you could imagine that, um, you know, that you have your simple model of a forest that only varies in humidity. Then you add another sample where now it varies in temperature. You add another sample where now there's biological agents moving things around and so on and so forth. And so you can explore these variations to build up complexity. And every time you build up, you sort of understand what the contribution to the phenomenon is from every layer of the onion that you add. Um, and then you can also, um, it, you know, by looking at these uh, sims or by thinking through these models that might inspire new general principles. Um, for, and I'll say development, and that might be like tech development. And so an example of this is I mentioned that back when Mitchell was describing ant colony trail pheromones, she in the book said that, you know, had an error where she said that, you know, trail pheromones allow the ants to distribute proportionally based on quality. But in reality, real trail pheromones don't because of this non-linear sensory pattern. Now, that said, 
The reason she said that is in the complexity community, there's a guy named Marco Dorigo uh, who inspired, who, who built this thing called ant colony optimization. And it's a it's a, an optimization tool that you can run on a computer. You have a really hard problem with lots of parameters. It's kind of like a, you know, it's like a simulated city, and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to configure the the, the, uh, the traffic light signals and uh, the tax rates and all these other things. And you can run a bunch of different sims, but there's just too many different parameter variations for you to run them all. So how do you choose which ones to run? Well, Dorigo said, well, imagine if they were ants walking over a parameter space, laying pheromone trails, then they like this in this abstract space where these virtual ants are walking around, then eventually you might get strong trails around parameters that um, optimize the parameter that you're interested in your sim. And this is the idea of ant colony optimization. In order for Dorigo to get that to work, he built pheromone trails inside his simulated ants that had, were linear in recruitment style. So they looked more like tandem runs in the way they recruited. So they didn't have this sharp uh, transition like real pheromone trails. And because of that, in his simulated ants, they distributed based on quality. And that was the mental model that Melanie Mitchell had in her head when she wrote the chapter wasn't thinking about real ants, was thinking about this simulated model. Well, Dorigo's model was wrong if we think about it in terms of explaining ants, but it was a darn interesting way to come up with an optimization algorithm that a computer can use to figure out the best way to configure a simulation when you're doing operations research. So it's an idea where sims aren't always about learning about the natural world, but they're about inspiring new general principles that we didn't think of before that allow us to develop new technology, not only for computers, but for figuring out um, when you're designing um, a, a review system, like at Amazon.com, whether I have reviews that live forever or whether they have a year expiration date, maybe they expire after 10 people read them. Um, these sort of ideas might be inspired by a simulation model of how information can kind of expire in these networks. And so that's kind of an example of getting principles from sims. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly. So the he was they were trying to figure out which models to run, um, and they used simulated pheromone trails to figure out which models to run. Well, well so he, it was one model. So the, the idea was so if I were to give this is kind of a little bit of diversion, but. Um, there's this thing called ant colony optimization. And this is um, usually attributed to a guy named Marco Dorigo. Um, and this, this is just, this won't be on the test. Um, and the idea is that if you had a hard optimization problem, a combinatorial optimization problem, you're like, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out um, the best way to configure my city or something like that. And, and you have a bunch of these different variables. You could say, um, you know, what should my uh, tax rate be? And so, well, there's a bunch of different options. Maybe it could be 1%, it could be 2%, it could be 4%, or whatever. You come up with a couple of discrete options. So let's say four options. And then I could say, well, then what should my, how many hospitals should I have? And so uh, maybe I could have, uh, you know, one hospital, two hospital, three hospitals. And I can come up with a bunch of these different things that could go into a simulated city for me to then see which city has the best, whatever our optimization metric is, happiness of the people, GDP, or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, economic output or whatever. Now, um, one way to sort of do this is if I had a bunch of these different things, and they all have a discrete set of choices. So some have more, some have less. One way is I could come up, I could say, well, there's uh, four of those, three of those, um, however many of those, however many of these. I could run every single possible combination. And that would mean running like four times three times three times 10, whatever. And each one of the, I could, each one of those I could run a sim of. Now maybe that simulated city takes 10 minutes to run. Maybe it takes a day to run. And so it might not be feasible for me to run all of these combinations. So it would be nice to figure out, and some of them are just going to be trash. Like 
Um, if you combine that tax rate and those hospitals and this parameter and that parameter, it's like so below the others that there's no use even playing with that combination. Like we should just not even investigate this. So what Dorigo said is that said, you know, if I lay this out like a grid, doesn't this kind of look like a, a physical space that ants can walk on? And so you can imagine if there was maybe a virtual nest up here, and maybe there's a food source over down here, and the ants need to find the best route to the food source. And he said, well, you know, an ant, if these are each like little islands they have to go to to get from top to bottom, the ants could go here first, then they could go here, then they go here and here and here. That's one way they could get through this. Or uh, they could go here, 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 and here. And, uh, or they could go a bunch of different routes. So there's all these different routes, every route, the virtual ants can get from nest to food corresponds to a different way you configure your city, where this route that I've got right here corresponds to these uh, four options, uh, or this particular option, that tax rate, those number of hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that's that. So then you can imagine after the ants go through all of that, when they reach the food source, the computer runs the sim. And it runs the sim, and the sim says, wow, for that choice, uh, this is how much money you collected in taxes, or this is how, many, how much sales you generated, or how many deaths. This is the infant mortality rate. Something that it could sim that you could recognize is a metric that's important to you. And if you want to maximize that or minimize that, then you could sort of um, report to the ants that that's the quality of that path. And that will then determine on their return trip going back the same path, how much pheromone they lay down on each one of those nodes. And so, um, so basically, uh, your simulated ants are constantly trying new options here. And then after they try them, they return and they lay down pheromone on those same options based on how well they did. And what happens over time is that your virtual ants will be attracted to where the highest amount of pheromone is. And they will gradually collapse onto a route that tends to be the best way to configure your simulated city. But there will be, because he used a, a, a linear censoring system, then um, there will be the second best will also have a strong flow to it. The third best will have maybe a little bit of a flow to it. Maybe the fourth best doesn't have any ants on that. But these simulated trails represent different ways you can configure your city. And that was um, you know, Dorigo's ant cleanup position. It turns out this is not how ants work. It was inspired by how ants work. It was tested out in simulation. It ends up being a really interesting way to optimize complicated problems that otherwise um, you wouldn't be able to just search through all the options. Yeah. So the reason it's not like ants is because ants, pheromones, pheromone trails grow exponentially or like log logarithmically. Yeah, they, they um, ants because um, um, the concentration as as gradually one uh, option gets more and more of that pheromone, um, it will eventually suck basically all the ants into that. So that, I mean, so in some ways, it, 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 there's, there's similarities, but this idea about distributing, like ants generally don't have, uh, mass recruiting ants, trailing ants, typically don't have a second best, a third best, a fourth best option that they maintain continuously. They generally always pick the best option. Um, and then they might have ants that are noisily exploring still, but it's not like they have the best option and the second best option is also being exploited and maybe a little bit of the third. It's not like that, but that's how this operates. And that's because um, the, uh, the way these ants sense pheromones, like the way real ants sense pheromones is that as the concentration increases, the probability to follow that trail is really non-linear. But the way these simulated ants uh, sense pheromones looks much more like this curve, where it's much more graded. So as the as you get a high concentration here, you do attract more ants, but you don't totally dominate 
if this one's got a little bit of a concentration on it. So you end up still maintaining multiple trails simultaneously, which works in the sim, but doesn't happen to be a good model what the ants do. But it's a really interesting principle for building optimization out like civil engineers do. So civil engineers, this is what we refer to as, um, and this is going way outside of the scope of this class, but this is what we refer to as an optimization meta heuristic is the fancy name for it, um, which is like a heuristic that finds heuristics. And so it's not guaranteed to find an optimal solution, but it tends to find really good solutions. And so a lot of civil engineers who work with really complicated problems that like material properties and all that, where you've got hundreds of different levers that you can push, if there's no mathematical model that can guide them, they load things up into these meta heuristics and ant optimization is one of them. And that gives them a good starting point for their future tests in the real world. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but does that, any questions about that? an example of how simulated simplistic models, even if they don't match reality, can generate new ideas for how we can intervene in the world um, in ways that we just maybe didn't think of before. So uh, another sort of interesting example is um, in Harare, Zimbabwe, um, there is this tower that has mostly passive cooling that supposedly was inspired by how termites um, that build these large kind of turrets. These, so there are these termites that um, if you look out in the field, you'll see a ton of these little towers. Um, and they'll just be all over. And they'll be like, and, and they're built by these termites. And for up until, I don't know, the 90s, people thought that these towers were cooling, that were structures that were cooling termites. Like that there was this sort of, they, they built a mathematical model. It was overly simplistic, but people bought it is saying that if you had a termite structure like this, then without any active uh, participants, without any air conditioning or whatever, you could get these natural flows that would create these circulating currents that would naturally push hot air out and bring cool air in. And that's what would keep termite colonies cool. And so in Zimbabwe, an architect learned about this model of termites and, um, and they built a building based on these principles. And initially they found, you know what, it doesn't actually kind of work that well. And they had to install fans to kind of get the flows going. But once they got the fans going, then it was great because they could keep the building cool without conventional air conditioning, just with a few fans. And it was, it was heralded as, a, as an accomplishment of biomimicry, of, an, of you know, termite inspired. It was a beautiful uh, idea because this building was near, you know, termites that use supposedly the same strategy, right? So, um, so you know, it's great. Then comes along a physiologist who actually instruments some of these termite colonies and finds out that that's not at all how they work. It turns out that, that the termite nests are always the same temperature as the ground, like a meter down. So basically, there's no funny, interesting process going on. It's just geothermal cooling, because that the termites, although they have these big turrets, they're, they're, uh, they go so far into the ground that they just naturally use the heat capacity of the earth to keep them cool. And there's none of this stuff going on about the heat moving around. So overnight, a beautiful biomimicry idea becomes just a good architectural idea that has zero to do with nature. And so we can't just say that because a solution is nature inspired, it's good. Because um, there's a bunch of nature inspired solutions that out of context are bad. I mean, look at the Argentine ants that are taking over California because they're out of their natural place there. So nature, you know, nature inspired doesn't immediately mean good. And if nature inspired is nature model inspired, that model might be wrong. Um, and, but they still, the model, even though it was wrong, it inspired architects to do things differently in a way that they maybe never would have come up with without seeing that the, the termites first. So it's, a, it's interesting how this, you know, you can see a natural phenomenon, you can come up with a model, um, you can play with the model, learn something interesting from the model. As long as you forget, don't forget that, you know, you may not have actually learned anything about termites, you might have just learned something about a model of termites. Then it's okay to then say, oh wow, that inspired a new idea. Then and test the idea for what it's worth. Don't say it's good because it came from 
termites, say it's good because I tested the performance and it's good for these performance reasons. So, you know, you don't want to greenwash an idea um, just because it appears to have something to do with nature. Um, you got to base it on performance, but you can get your performance through simplistic models, which were inspired by nature, but ultimately don't have anything to do with them. If that makes any sense. Any other questions about that? So this general idea about inspiring general principles from the simplistic models, even when the simplistic models are not very good. Okay, and then um, and then the other sort of thing that Mitchell stressed was that we can use these simplistic um, models as a way to build other models. So we can identify um, generalities. Uh, for development of, um, or to be captured in mathematics. So math models are often seem inscrutable, like they involve a lot of symbology and semantics and syntax that are difficult to read. But if you know how to read them, math models are even simpler than computational models. There's a lot less going on in a math model. And so, um, so the nice thing about math models is they help us, um, if we really think that there's only a couple of things that are responsible for an observed phenomenon, then um, figuring out what those couple of things are, we can do in SIM. And we can say, well, in these SIMs, it really seems like these two levers that we play with in our sim seem to be driving everything. That inspires us to build a math model, which only has those two levers, which now allows us to solve that math model and provide formulas that make it easier for us to make quantitative predictions that we can test in the real world. So sometimes we use simulation models as sort of a way to prototype in order for us to build math models, but then help us to better understand um, a phenomenon that we can then later further test in the real world. So these are kind of Mitchell's examples of how these simplistic models um, can be used. And for me, what I take from this or what I usually uh, teach about this is that when we think about models and, and these sort of four things, there's what I call a modeling spectrum, which varies from realism and um, hyper specificity on one end to simplicity and generality on the other end. And so um, you can imagine that like, you know, this could be like a monopoly board game. And then over here, this might be, um, you know, an actual New York City city block. Both of them can be viewed as model systems, but the insights I get from the New York City city block may be so specific that they will not be valid if I think about a Los Angeles city block or a Columbus, Ohio city block. So they're um, very realistic. So this is like a good operational case. Like if I'm a mayor of New York City, I want to know how does this work on my city block? But if I'm uh, just generally studying cities, then maybe studying one block of New York City is going to not be a great, you know, th there may not be as many general principles, but something like the board game of Monopoly is it hyper generalistic. So like, you know, there are general principles of, of real estate that apply across a wide range of cities. And so even though it's super simplistic, like I wouldn't say, hey, Mr. Mayor or Ms. Mayor of New York City, um, you should adjust, you know, real estate taxes because of this result I found in Monopoly. That would be crazy, but, if I want to just know qualitatively what happens as you increase the costs of real estate, that qualitative pattern might show up in the board game and would inspire me to then move toward more realistic models to test 
the limits of that pattern as I get towards these human cities. So really, as we do our work as modelers, we try to, um, to find ourselves in the middle here, where um, these are what I'm going to call insightful models. They are um, specific enough to not have a trivial result, uh, but they are general enough to allow us to have a result which applies to more than one system, applies to a wide range of systems, and hopefully simple enough that they're actually tractable. What I mean by tractable is it's not going to cost millions of dollars to run this model. Um, you know, if I need to. Um, if I need to take a New York City city block and have full control over it for a month, um, that's going to be very costly. If I need to play around with Monopoly, that's really cheap. So if I need to run a computer simulation model that simulates um, a generic city with a million people, um, maybe that takes me an hour, maybe a day to simulate. But you know, a day of computer time is a lot cheaper than actually going out and then finding like an LA block, a Columbus Auto block, a New York City block, and then you know, run my experiment on the city blocks. So you get you know, cost, you know, these are costly over here. Um, these are cheap. And so this is sort of a balance to hopefully maximal, maximize insight for minimal cost. And um, that's and this kind of you know goes to this whole all models are wrong, but some are useful. A quote from George Box. That's from George um, E. P. Box. I'll do G. E. P. Box. Um, Box was a statistician, and. He wasn't criticizing models. He was saying, no, 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 all models, regardless of where they are on the spectrum, are wrong. No model is a perfect surrogate for whatever system you're studying. But um, some models are going to be more insightful than others. And so that's what he's sort of saying here is that when we build models and use models, we have to pick the models that provide us the maximal insight. Um, and so, um, you know, it may be totally useless to study a hyper-realistic model in New York City if ultimately I want to know about principles that apply to LA. Um, likewise, it might be uh, totally useless to study monopoly if I need, really need an operational principle that apply next week in New York. Um, but if I'm generally studying, like, why do um, you know, fisheries, you know, if I look across a bunch of fisheries and some of them collapse, and can never recover, while well, other um, collapse and then bounce back the next year. Well, maybe I can build a relatively simplistic fishery and see are there parameter combinations I can push through, where in some they collapse and never recover, and others they collapse and recover very quickly, and then study the difference between those parameters. And that will inspire me to eventually move to a more realistic model. But regardless of what model I'm using, it's all going to be wrong. It's, it, it, but our goal isn't to make an accurate model. Our goal is to make an insightful model that takes us to a new place in thought so that we better understand sort of the questions. So does that make sense? I mean, by the modeling spectrum here, that all models are wrong, all models fit somewhere on a spectrum like this. Generally, our goal is to start somewhere in the middle and over time move towards that side. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are only taught one method, computer modeling, math modeling, um, empirical modeling, um, and so on, and they end up kind of getting stuck doing sort of a model's first approach to science. And um, hopefully, when, when you find yourself being a methodological expert, you remember to collaborate with others who do other types of modeling so that you can move. Because if you're just stuck with doing one model, you know, you might be the wrong model. You might be the non-useful model. Because, you know, just because you know how to do a model that sits here doesn't mean that's the right place for this particular study. All right, questions about that? Pretty clear. The message. 
All right, so um, so with that, I did want to sort of, uh, you know, make sure that we summarize the, you know, the kind of lessons from the chapter about uh, the prisoner's dilemma and iterated or repeated prisoner's dilemma. So, um, so if we, just as a reminder, and the key thing to remember with the prisoner's dilemma, it's not the payoffs that really define the prisoner's dilemma, it's the equilibria. It's the fact that mutual defection is what we call a national equilibria, and mutual cooperation is a, a, is a more beneficial, dominant, cooperative equilibria, Pareto equilibria. It's those two things that define the prisoner's dilemma. And the payoffs happen to bring us there. But what you should remember when somebody says prisoner's dilemma, you shouldn't try to be remembering the payoffs. You should be remembering that, oh, in the prisoner's dilemma, that's the game where me personally, I'm better off defecting. Even though if I could manage to guarantee that my partner would cooperate, that we both would be better off cooperating. That's, um, that's the key feature of the prisoner's dilemma. And we capture that by saying, you know, if we've got a player B, prisoner B, and a player A, and um, if we could either uh, defect, which is be silent or cooperate. So just as a reminder, defect is silent. I'm sorry, defect, I got that backwards. We could either defect, which is testify, or cooperate, which is stay silent. And uh, so we can both cooperate, or we can both defect, or we could do some combination of the two. And we draw a little payoff matrix. And, um, and so we say that, um, so a lot of times we, in payoff matrices, we just use a comma to say like one number comma another number, and the one on the left goes to player A and one on the right goes to player B. Um, I was kind of, you know, for uh, training wheels, kind of just dividing these boxes this way so that um, the, the, you know, the upper right side is clearly goes to player B and the lower left side goes to player A. And so um, in, if we have both cooperating, they both get a reward for cooperation, which we can set at three, but the number isn't as important as the relationship. If B defects and A cooperates, well then, um, B um, will the defector gets a major benefit. And so that's why we call it the temptation to defect, which we'll set kind of arbitrarily at five. And you can think of these numbers and prisoners as like how many years off their sentence. And so, and then, then the um, sucker uh, who cooperated ends up getting zero years off their sentence. So if it goes the other way around, if player A is the defector and player B is the sucker, then uh, player A is going to get the temptation to defect, and player B is going to get the sucker's payoff. And then if they both defect, uh, they both testify against each other, uh, then um, there's no sucker exactly, uh, but they both get a penalty for defection. So they, so they each get one year off their sentence, um, as opposed to one of them getting five years off their sentence. And when we uh, and the key feature of the prisoner's dilemma, so the prisoner's dilemma has the feature that the temptation is greater than the reward is greater than the punishment is greater than the sucker's payoff. And to remember that arrangement, you just have to keep in mind that the key feature of the prisoner's dilemma is that there is always the temptation to defect has got to be the highest thing. That's why it makes it tempting. And the sucker's payoff has got to be the lowest thing. So then you just have to remember, so um, which does R or P, which ones of those are two things are bigger? Well, the, the key thing to remember is that it's be, the thing that makes it a dilemma is that if they would cooperate, they'd get a higher reward than if they didn't. And so that's what makes R greater than P. So, so that's the thing to remember that. T has always got to be the biggest, S has always got to be the smallest, 
And to make it a dilemma, the cooperation reward is bigger than the penalty for punishment. Yeah. Is that a question? Um, wait, okay. So the, what do they all stand for? T is for? Uh, T is the temptation to defect. Um, and, you know, this is a reward for cooperation. This is a punishment for mutual defection. And this is the sucker's payoff. And the key thing about the prisoner's dilemma is that the um, is that the this yellow thing that I highlighted here, this is what we refer to as the Nash equilibrium, which basically means that here, no player can benefit via a unilateral movement. So if one player changes and the other player doesn't, uh, that player will do worse. So if I look at, um, if, I, if player B, which is defecting, if player B decides, oh, actually, you know, what if I would have cooperated? Well, if player B cooperated, they go from getting one to getting zero. Um, similarly, if player A, who's now defecting, cooperated, they go from getting one to getting zero. So if you are the only one changing, you're gonna do worse. And that's what, that's what defines, it's called a Nash equilibrium. Now, the, um, the other thing about this prisoner's dilemma is that there is a solution up here, both cooperating, and so both cooperating is um, what we would call Pareto efficient. Um, and in fact, um, we'll say payoff dominant to both defective. So Pareto efficient just means there are no Pareto movements you can make away from it. So another term for Pareto efficient is, um, is the socially efficient. So if you happen to be in a Pareto efficient, and if you think about it, these other solutions here are also Pareto efficient. Um, but this one's special in that it is, it dominates the Nash equilibrium. So um, it is better for both. If they're playing the Nash, it is better for both to change and become cooperative. But they both have to decide to become cooperative. And because they aren't coordinating with each other, then they have no guarantee that that will be the outcome. So that's the dilemma. If they both would just decide to cooperate, then they would do better than the Nash equilibrium. But the safe thing for them to do is to defect um, because as you're defecting, then you can't regret a defection because you know, regret is all about assuming all of the other players do exactly what they did. I can't regret the choice I made. Um, and so that's what Nash is all about. There's no regret. But if I can manage to get the other players to do something else, then all of us would end up doing better. And that's what we mean by social efficiency. Everyone is, everyone gets better. So in a socially efficient is there's no way for everyone to improve together. So does everybody see that Nash is not socially efficient? The top corner is, but it is not a Nash. Yeah. So basically, if 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 what I understood in the book was right, then if the prisoner's dilemma is only run once, then it is smarter to do the Nash 
Right, so we're, we're about to get to the iteration. So I'll, I'll add that in just a second. But yeah, and just in general, we just think about the one time, then the pragmatic thing to do is to play the Nash. And that's a dilemma because um, it's not the socially efficient thing to do. So there's dead weight loss to society. So that's the term we use. When, you, when there is a socially efficient solution, but we're not uh, uh, arriving at it via market forces, then we refer to there being dead weight loss. There is loss to society. These two prisoners are losing out because they're not cooperating. But there's really no mechanism to get them to cooperate because the temptation to defect is too damn high. That's the key point about the Nash equilibrium. The temptation to defect destroys a potential Nash in the top left corner. And the only Nash left over is the bottom right, which is inefficient, which has an ability to do that. That's the key point of the previous Yeah. Doesn't that mean that the Nash equilibrium is an example of the tragedy of the commons? That's what some people use it as an example of the tragedy of the commons. Um, what I'm going to get to here in a second here is that there is a better game that is a model from tragedy of the commons. But the, generically, if it's like game theory 101, um, we only have one model we're going to teach you. We're going to teach the prisoner's dilemma. It is the most generic. It's just like on my modeling continuum. This is the most, this is the monopoly board game. This is the like overly simplistic. I'm going to demonstrate some general properties with this. But in reality, a lot of sustainability scientists say this is obscure and weird. This is not what happens in real life. This does not describe solutions we have in real life. People are much more cooperative in real life than this would suggest. So there's something wrong with this model. But, you know, at a first glance, this is a decent, it starts to get us there. And that's why it's been so popular. All right. Any other questions about the general layout? All right. So that was one of the things that really inspired Axelrod and others to sort of say, if we, if our thoughts about the evolution of cooperation are built around this mental model, um, then we have no way of understanding how we get the huge amount of cooperation that we see in nature and human society and elsewhere. How do we explain that? And, you know, and so um, there are different ways we can, you know, so, you know, how to explain cooperation in a prisoner's dilemma-like world. And one way to do it is relatedness. So um, if I am genetically related to you, then if there are alleles for cooperation in me, then and in you, if those alleles are the same, then me helping you is actually helping me. So what relatedness does is it shares uh, uh, rewards across players. And I've gone through, I think if you look at my instructor notes, I think I went through and I, I gave this sort of in, in much more detail, but, um, but maybe I'll give kind of like one example here. So, um, <laughs> Normally, you would think that, like, imagine that someone cooperated and the other one defected. Well, normally, one of them would get the uh, sucker's payoff, which, remember, in our example, is zero, and the other one would get the temptation to defect five. And so that would make defecting very tempting. But if we're related, Zutite, maximally related, and we get to share our rewards, then I actually put a plus sign there. And we both will end up getting five divided by two, which is equal to 2.5. So you can imagine now that, um, that um, well, that's if we share it. In fact, let's go even further um, and say, we just both get five. So um, if one of us, um, it, if we think about from the, sort of the genes perspective, then uh, maybe it doesn't care which one of us gets five. As long as one of us gets five, then it gets five. So if we are sharing because we're related, then suddenly the sucker isn't that bad that, that, that off because they're going to share the temptation with the, the one who's uh, uh, with the other one. Now, 
Um, likewise, um, if we both decide to cooperate, so let's say do cooperation, cooperation. Well, now both of us are gonna get the reward, which was three. And so that is gonna equal six. So now, since we're sharing rewards, actually, even though, um, so there's less risk if I cooperate, you defect, there's less risk because if you end up being, you know, paying off, you're getting a, a big reward, I'm going to get part of it. But not only that, if we both manage to cooperate, then now it's even better than this condition right here. And if we go back to the sort of defect, defect, you know, here, where we both would get the punishment, well, that's just going to be equal to two. Um, and so what we see here now is there is a strong, um, you know, if we're related, then there is a strong evolutionary force that's going to support cooperation among relatives. And so relatedness solves the problem. Um, yeah, question. Um, so, and we haven't got um, iteration yet. So this is just without iteration, just relatedness. Yeah. Okay. So the, I guess I just, so the alleles are sh shared. Why would the, for the first, um, example where one, uh, uh, I don't know, one, one's a sucker and one is like temptation or whatever. Why would temptation still share with the sucker? Well, that's because the, the, the defector, if the defector is related, then if we both have the same alleles. And so if my helping you causes you to have five offspring and I have nothing, then um, what we're sort of saying is that um, I could have had five offspring on my own, or you could have had five offspring. But from the allele's perspective, it doesn't matter whether the offspring are coming from you or coming from me. Um, so, so if that's why six is still better because then it's going to be more offspring. Right. And if it's, you can have these, it works the same way two and a half, three, and one, um, if, you, if you prefer that. But yeah, that's that's what's one. So, relatedness aligns your agendas because. Even though individually you get screwed over, collectively um, from the alleles perspective, and this is the so-called kind of selfish gene. Um, so you know, some people say, you know, why? Uh, you know, the selfish gene perspective is that why would you personally sacrifice yourself for your children? Um, well, it's it's not because you're an altruist. It's actually the opposite of that. It's that your genes don't. It's kind of like your genes are turning into zombies. It's like your genes don't care about you as the individual, they care about them and their kind of proliferation or longevity. And so saving your children is a way for your genes to continue for future generations. And so you can sacrifice the individual because the genes survive. And so that's the so-called selfish gene and hypothesis model. All right, so that's the basis of relatedness is one way to do that. Uh, the other way to, to deal with this is payment. So, um, you know, similarly, you can imagine that uh, one player is paid to cooperate. And so if that were the case, then even if there's like a cooperation and a defection, then you get the suckers payoff plus whatever some, you know, payment is. And that's what goes to one player and then the temptation to defect goes to the other player. Well, if the payoff is large enough, then um, even though you're the sucker, you're actually being paid to be the sucker. And so that resolves the problem. So that's another way to sort of turn the prisoner's dilemma into a different type of game, resolving the problem. So payment relatedness, great. So that is the easy way to resolve the problem and explain cooperation. So uh, what about unrelated individuals? without uh, payment. Because a lot of the cooperation we see in nature is among unrelated individuals who aren't exchanging benefits. And so, um, so they, this is where, you know, this is really why Axelrod wanted to run his simulation because in the 50s, there were already people saying that iteration, repeated interactions should generate a pro-social force that will generate cause people to cooperate. And so Axelrod, based on those old ideas, asked people to submit simple um, uh, 
mechanisms for deciding whether you're cooperating and effective based on the history of your partners in this computer simulation. And then you just sort of see, see like, well, then over a simulation where we have repeated interactions, how well does each strategy do? And then that determines how many of these strategies survive in the next generation and so on and so forth. And that's the sim that Axelrod ran. And what Axelrod found was basically that when you, um, when there's iteration or repetition, repeated interactions, um, then you could say uh, strategies with reciprocity generate a high amounts of cooperation. And so the, 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 major, the, the biggest sort of example for this was the so-called tit for tat strategy that cooperates first and then copies player after that. And so the idea here is that if you and I are iterating or repeating, so if I'm remembering what you did last and, um, and I just do that last, then what it, it does is it, it makes it so that um, your benefit ends up being my benefit later. So in previous rounds, if um, uh, in previous rounds, if we cooperated, then uh, that that ends up giving us the promise of us cooperating in the future, in the future, in the future. So in other words, um, our, it aligns our agendas together because now um, my, like, it might be that you, if you screw me over in the past, then I'm going to screw you over in the future. So because of that, your future rewards are tied to my current rewards. So what, what this basically generates is what some people have called a temporal relatedness. So you're basically sharing a reward over time. So I'm not related to you, but our past history and how well, how well you did in the past is going to affect how well I do in the future. How well I did in the past is going to affect how well you do in the future. And so it's almost as if we've got shared alleles that are now benefiting from each other. But now we've got two different you know, alleles, but they're cooperating with each other because the, um, we, in order for me to continue to do well, you have to continue to do well. And that creates a temporal relatedness. Yeah, so I feel like so is cooperation almost like part of your genes then? Because you well, like the, the animals that learn to cooperate better could survive better? Well, I mean, really, this whole thing is about how do cooperative traits get maintained? And so the thought is that if there are genes that relate to pro social behaviors, cooperation, um, why don't those alleles get? flushed out of the population by natural selection. And so Axelrod and colleagues were trying to study, are there simple systems where we can actually show that cooperative traits provide a fitness advantage? And so they would be supported by natural selection. And that might provide us a way to see how cooperation could evolve in natural systems. So yeah, it ends up coming back to relatedness. And then others like, um, you know, uh, so, you know, Mitchell also mentions uh, Martin Novak. And Novak basically shows that if you, if everyone is forced to interact on a grid, so I am only, only can um, uh, interact with the eight spots that are around me. Um, and so when I cooperate, I'm playing kind of this game with these eight. Um, even if you have static strategies, so it's not tit for tat anymore. It's just you put a pure cooperator and a pure defector. And then based on that, you can say, well, how well has this space done? 
And what Novak found is you can get clusters of cooperators uh, can persist and basically allow for cooperation to persist in a network. So um, this is what uh, Novak called um, network relatedness, or you might call spatial relatedness. So again, if you're forced to live with someone, you kind of, your agendas are aligned. You don't want to screw over your roommate because your roommate's going to screw you over. And so you might as well both just decide ahead of time that you're always going to cooperate because a house full of cooperators um, who live together for a long amount of time um, is going to be a better house than a house with a bunch of defectors. So that was the other thing. And then um, the other thing that uh, Mitchell mentioned is that Axelrod also experimented with punishment. And basically the big thing is that they showed that um, punishment can encourage cooperation. So, um, and you know, Mitchell talks about this in more detail, but basically um, if you've got uh, a defector who then someone else after they witness defection um, will pay a cost to inflict a, another cost on the defector, that by itself, well, you then also need to get people being willing to be punishers. So they mentioned that you need meta norms. So if you witness someone not punishing someone else, you can punish them. And so that in itself will start actually generating uh, a, a spread of cooperation because it becomes too costly to defect. So from Axelrod's perspective, Axelrod and Novak, there's sort of two routes to cooperation. So there's the relatedness route, and so relatedness here, this could be due to actual sort of genetic relatedness. It could be due to temporal relatedness and, or, or this could be due to um, uh, network relatedness or spatial relatedness. And, um, and this is sort of like the carrot of cooperation. And then there's also punishment. And this is like the stick. And so these are our two routes to cooperation. According to Axel. All right, now um, we don't have a lot of time to get into this too much here, um, but um, in reality, this this ends up not being that useful of a game because it's the temptation to defect is sort of too high uh, relative to what we kind of see in a lot of systems. Is that um, usually um, we we actually have a much greater what we would say positive externality. In other words, when people cooperate, it's usually much more beneficial than the prisoner's dilemma models. So there's another game that has become more useful in sustainability science called stag hunt. And this basically is when you have large positive externalities. So it is very good to cooperate. And I may end up just finishing up with these um, on Tuesday and maybe I'll extend uh, the deadline for the, um, or no, I guess on Thursday. Um, and, but the idea behind stack up is very, very similar to the prisoner's dilemma, but we've got the upper left corner is going to have a much sweeter reward. So the idea here is I have two hunters, hunter B and hunter A. And um, there are these large deer, you know, stags out there that they could take down. They can only take down if they work together. So if they work together, uh, so if B decides to hunt a stag and A decides to hunt a stag, um, then they both will get a large reward. So I'll just lines here. And so in this case, they'll both get, let's say, a reward for cooperation of eight. 
Um, now, um, the other option is they could go it alone and say, you know what, there's rabbits, there's hares that are around. And if I just go it alone and don't look for the stags, I'm going to find a rabbit and that'll be enough to feed me. It won't be enough, the same amount of meat as the stag, but it'll be plenty. So um, I'm going to just use the same letters that I used in the prisoner's dilemma. I'm going to say that the punishment for going alone, but it, you know, it's P, the punishment doesn't really apply here, is five for both of them. So if they go it alone, they both get a decent meal. If one of them goes for the stag, but not the other, then there get the sucker's penalty. So if you go for stag while the other goes for hare, then um, that is going to give you a penalty because there's no way you're going to capture a stag on your own. But if the other guy goes for, or gal goes for stag, um, while you go for hare, there's more hare available. And so you get a temptation to go for hare, which isn't as great as the stag rule. So this basically, if I were to look at this, this is basically R is greater than T, is greater than or equal to P, is greater than S, and then S is equal to zero typically. And this is the stag hunt. And if you notice the big difference between it and the prisoner's dilemma is that relationship thing. So, Think about that, and um, and I'll pick up there on Thursday and wrap this up. To sort of because I also want to introduce Hawk Bell, um, and um, and I'm gone over, so I'll just give everybody a ten minutes credit, and I'll see you Thursday. Thanks.